Prabhu, you can operate. Maharaj has been teaching 
in the Southeast, uh, Southeast Asian countries and Russia and China and uh, sometimes in India also. He is also uh, a teacher um, of Mayapur Institute, Ma Maharaj is teaching Bhakti Shastri, Bhakti Vaibhav, Bhakti Vedanta and Bhakti Sarvamama. And uh, Southeast Asian countries where Maharaj is teaching are Taiwan, Singapore, Hong Kong, Malaysia, Thailand. And uh, through his years of preaching, he has given many, many devotees, like uh, many, many souls he has made uh, the devotees give practical guidance and inspiration. Maharaj was like, you know, given sannyas in the year of 1994 from His Krishna Maharaj. Maharaj, like, you know, always rested in his sadhana and, uh, like, you know, simplicity in few minutes, they realized. Okay. So, we are very fortunate to have Maharaj here today on the auspicious occasion of Radha Shri Hare Krishna. And Maharaj is going to speak about some memories of Srila Prabhupada, like, you know, after the Flower of Shri. So, initially, we have Kirtan and Flower of Shri, and then Maharaj will speak. There is Prashadam for everybody after the program. Hare Krishna.
No, actually, first I met Prabhupada. You could say I met the devotees. I met the devotees through their recording. They had recorded the Hare Krishna mantra and they had recorded the Govinda record. So those were the, that was the music which uh, introduced me to Krishna consciousness. I had also seen a Back to Godhead magazine. In the Back to Godhead magazine, I remember, it had a wonderful illustration of Lord Nishringadev on the cover. And then later on, after I had finished my studies and gone to London, I was working in a job there. I had seen a book entitled Krishna, The Personality of Godhead. And it was a beautiful book. It was a big silver colored book with the beautiful picture of Radha and Krishna on the cover. And inside were many illustrations. So I was very attracted to the book and I purchased it and took it home. I showed my friend and he said, oh, I've got a book by the same person. <laughs> and amazing, this is 1971. You can imagine, it wasn't very common. There were not many books, actually. When we joined the movement, in those days, there were very less books. Anyway, the Krishna book had come out, volume one. And somehow, my friend, he had a book. He had a book called The Topmost Yoga System. So I took him and I read it. And I was surprised that I could actually understand it because I'd been reading books by other spiritual teachers, but I never really felt that I could understand what they were talking about. It was not very clear, the, the way that the language and the, the presentation, what they were talking about, you know, the oneness and the merging and, you know, as if, as if everything flows into the ocean and becomes one. I was like, what, what is this all about? It, it, was, it was not very appealing to me. But Srila Prabhupada made it very clear to us that by chanting the Hare Krishna mantra, we could awaken our spiritual consciousness. And that we are all spiritual living entities. And we all have an eternal relationship with God. And so that was very meaningful to me and I was very happy to know that by chanting Hare Krishna I could make so much progress in my life. I was looking for a teacher, I was looking for a guide and somehow Prabhupada came to me in the form of his books. And then I remembered, you know, I used to purchase incense. And the incense I used to purchase was made by Hare Krishna people. The devotees who had come to the UK had come from the USA and in the USA they had began making incense. And they, they called the incense spiritual sky. <laughs> spiritual sky incense. And it was different from Indian incense, you know. Indian incense is mild and gentle, but the incense which they were making was very strong, powerful aromas like strawberry and cherry and lemon and <laughs> these kind of, of odors, you know. Very strong smelling. So I used to purchase this incense and on the packet of the incense it used to say that there's a temple, there's a center in London and people can come and you're invited to come for sunrise meditation and also we have a Sunday program 
and you can come and enjoy the vegetarian food. And so I, I used to read this on the packet, but somehow I never went. You know, I was busy with other things, living in a place like London. There's a lot to do, a lot of things to occupy you. But after I got the book, and after I read the book, then I thought, I have to go. I should go to the temple. So I began to go to the temple, and it was a surprise for me to meet the devotees there. At that time, the, the temple had only been open like maybe a year or so, or two years. The devotees were not many. There, were, there was about 15 or 18 young men and they were all like 18 or 20. I was old, I was 21. <laughs> so that was the thing of our Krishna consciousness movement. We were all young, there were two ladies there, but they were not British. One was from France and the other one was from America. And somehow they were there in England and they were both devotees. So I came to the temple and I attended the RT. And when we had RT, we had a lot of... It was amazing how the enthusiasm which the devotees had during the RT. They would... They, they had already installed deities there. The deities are worshipped still today. Radha London Ishwara, named by Srila Prabhupada. Beautiful Radha and Krishna deities, which were donated. When the devotees found the place for a temple, Srila Prabhupada said, you have to have deities, you should have some deity. But where to get deities from? England. We no idea where we could find deities. But then somehow they heard that there was one Indian community who had deities of Radha and Krishna. But there was some problem with the deities and they were not going to install them. What had happened was the little finger on the hand of Radharani had cracked. So because of that, they decided that, oh, we cannot install the deities. So anyway, Srila Prabhupada heard about it and he went with the devotees. The few, there was a few uh, you had devotees from USA who were there and they went with Prabhupada to see the man and to see the deities. So they came there and they met the Indian gentleman and he was very nice to them and very friendly. And Prabhupada was reciprocating and he was being very friendly with the man and thanking him and everything. And then Prabhupada then said, so we will take the deities. And the man said, no, just wait, just no, no, no. And then, no, no, Prabhupada said, no, it's okay. He said, pick them up, can you manage? <laughs> and tomorrow, yes, Prabhupada, no problem. <laughs> you know, so they picked up the deity, and the man, the man no, wait, wait. <laughs> Prabhupada, go, go. <laughs> and this way, they kind of uh, kidnapped <laughs> the deities, rather interesting. And after they got the deities, into the temple where they were going. Prabhupada said, he said, Radharani personally cracked the finger just so that she could come to us. Yeah. 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 It's the arrangement of Radha and Krishna that they worship in our temple rather than in this other place. So that way they had installed the deity. They were actually the first uh, large-sized deities of Radha and Krishna anywhere in the world to be worshipped by the ISKCON devotees. It was the first set deities. And they made their appearance by their own 
by their own arrangements. We, we didn't buy them from Jaipur or anything like that. They personally come there and they personally came to Prabhupada and they could be installed in our temple there. So the devotees were worshipping these deities and we were all very young devotees. The, not, the, the Prabhupada had taken all the senior devotees with him to India for preaching. They had come to London and they opened the temple, but then Prabhupada told them, now you come with me to India. And so they all left, the, the senior devotees who had come to England, they all left and went to India because they thought, oh great, we're going to go to India. And then they were really excited and they wanted to go to India and help Prabhupada to begin Krishna consciousness in India. But it, it left very few people there in the temple in London. And so there, like I say, there was about 15 or 18 devotees and they are all young. Most of them not initiated. Oh, there was one Indian person there. I was surprised. I remember when I came to the temple, I was surprised. I thought, oh, even an Indian person has joined this. <laughs> of course, most of our devotees today are Indian, you know, in the Hindu origin. But uh, in those days, it was all Westerners. But there was this one Indian young man who joined. And he's still a devotee. Maybe you met him. Did you ever meet Subhag Swami? Yes, yes Subhag Swami. So he joined in London. He came. His parents had sent him to London because when he was growing up in Calcutta, he was associating with many sadhus. His parents thought, well, we don't want him to become a sadhu. <laughs> so we'll send him to England to get education. So he went to England and he met devotees and he became a devotee. And he was living in the temple. Now he, he actually should have been initiated but he said, I want to wait till Prabhupada comes. He said, I want to take it personally from Prabhupada. And so, later on, Prabhupada did come. He came. He was, you know, we were always waiting. When is Prabhupada coming? When is he coming? And the Pujari, there was this one French lady, she was like the Pujari. She was the only one who was doing the puja because she was the only one who was initiated. So she would all, Prabhupada's coming very soon. Prabhupada's coming very soon. But it went on week after week, <laughs> week and after months, and Prabhupada's coming very soon. <laughs> then finally it happened. And so that was very And Prabhupada came to the temple, came to London. We all went to the airport. In those days, airports were much nicer than they are today. Today, you know, you don't get in airports. There's so much security and everything. But in those days, it was much more slack. There were there was there were no such things as terrorists and all all of this. So we all went to the airport. And we were all sitting there in the airport chanting and waiting for Prabhupada to come. And then, middle of the night, Prabhupada came. And it's the middle of the night, Prabhupada came on a flight from USA. And we just saw Prabhupada appearing. And he just smiled at all of us. And we all fell down on the ground, offered our babies. And Prabhupada just got in the car and went back to the temple. So we all rushed back to the temple to go to see Prabhupada. Prabhupada was actually living with us in London in our little temple. We had a rented place there in London. It was a small building which we had rented. So what happened was a devotee came from 
one of the senior devotees came from California and he came to London and he saw our center and he said, Oh no, Prabhupada stay here. He said, this room is not good enough for Prabhupada. No, no, these conditions are not very good. He said, no, no, but this is not really suitable to have Prabhupada here in this place. So he wrote to Prabhupada and he told Prabhupada, he said, Prabhupada, when you come to London, we will get you a hotel room. We'll get you a suite in the hotel. But Prabhupada wrote back and said, I don't want to stay in the hotel. I want to stay in the temple. He said, I like that room. <laughs> and so Prabhupada did it. So, we did it. Although we were many people all living in the house, but Prabhupada was happy to be there in the temple. And Prabhupada liked to stay in the temple, didn't like to stay in the hotel. And uh, later on, of course, we got George Harrison purchased what's called the Bhaktivedanta Manor. And then Prabhupada would go and stay there. But still he would come to visit the other temple which was there in London. So Prabhupada liked to be with the devotees. He liked to be with all of us. And every morning, he would go for a walk. The doctor had told him that, Swamiji, you should walk. It be good for your heart. Every morning you should get some exercise. And so Prabhupada took it seriously. Every morning he would go out on a walk. And the devotees also, we would like to go with Prabhupada and walk with Prabhupada. We have to be careful though. We have to be careful because, you know, Devotee, when we're walking, we like to hear what Prabhupada is saying. And sometimes you try to get too close. And you may even hit Prabhupada's foot or something. So Prabhupada, don't get too close. Don't. <laughs> you know, you have, to, you have to be very careful walking with Prabhupada. So sometimes they would restrict who could go with Prabhupada, who gets to go with Prabhupada on the walk. And sometimes we'd have a car. In those days, our movement was very young. We didn't even have a car at first. And somehow we managed to get one vehicle just for, for Prabhupada's use when he came. Because Prabhupada liked to go to big parks and walk in the park in the morning. And so we'd have a car to take Prabhupada to the park. But then to go in the park, not everybody can go in the car, so only a few people go with Prabhupada. Like it's not very easy to get a lot of association with Prabhupada. You have to understand, when I joined the Krishna Consciousness Movement, I was very new, I didn't know anything. I come out of the material world, and I'd only been studying engineering, you know, <laughs> mathematics and all these horrible things. That was the only thing I knew. I knew the Laplace transformations and Fourier analysis, but I didn't know anything about Bhagavad Gita. And so, being with Prabhupada, I really didn't have much to say to Prabhupada. I would just try to hear. Prabhupada. I, I put my concentration in hearing whatever Prabhupada was saying. I didn't try to question Prabhupada or, you know, get in a discussion with him or anything. I was very new, you know, Prabhupada was 70 something years old and he spent his whole life in devotional consciousness as a coming Growing up as a devotee, he was always Krishna conscious. He said, there was never a time when I did not think of Krishna. So, although Prabhupada had been working and he had his family and everything, but still, he said, never was there a time when I was not Krishna conscious. 
and if he had followed the principles, he'd never even drank tea in his whole life. So I was coming out of a very Western culture, you know, I didn't have that kind of upbringing at all. And I was aware of my cultural lacking, so I kept quiet when I was around Srila Prabhupada. I didn't want to show my ignorance. And then they would try to hear. Of course, sometimes my ignorance would be exposed. Just like one time when Prabhupada was there in England, it happened that a newspaper reporter came. Not actually a newspaper, it was a magazine. There was a magazine which was published there in the UK. And the reporter was interviewing people. And somehow he came and talked to me. And I was just a new devotee. I'd only just joined the movement, you know. But he was speaking to me and asking me about Krishna consciousness. And he was asking me, I don't know. He asked me, I remember, he asked me, what is this AC Bhaktivedanta? I don't know. <laughs> I really didn't know anything. I was just totally new, you know. And and he, it, somehow I, I started to talk things which I'd read from my body books because I'd read about different other spiritual teachers and I was influenced by a lot of nonsense philosophy. And when the newspaper, when that reporter wrote his article, he put some of the things which I said there in the article. And somehow, Prabhupada, they read the article to Prabhupada. And Prabhupada said, this is not good. Who said these things? <laughs> he said, people have to learn the philosophy. All the devotees have to learn the philosophy. So that was my instruction. I got that instruction that I should read Prabhupada's books carefully. And I should learn the philosophy. So I'm still trying to do that. I'm still studying Prabhupada's books. And I'm also, I find it helpful also to be teaching Krishna Consciousness, teaching with the Mayapur Institute. We have many classes. I've been teaching there since the beginning of the Mayapur Institute, maybe nearly 20 years ago. We began by just having seminars during the Lord Purnima. But it's developed more and more, and we have classes going on. Uh, usually we, all the classes are online. We use Zoom and give lectures to devotees all over the world. People come and take our courses, the Bhakti Shastri course, where they study the Bhagavad Gita, and. Ishopanisha, nectar of instruction, nectar of devotion. And then others who are more serious, they go on and study Bhakti by Bhav, the first six cantos of Srimad Bhagavatam. And then those really, really serious, they study Bhakti Sarvabhoma, which is canto seven up to canto twelve. And then there's another course where you study Chaitanya Charitam. So actually these courses, this, this was there in Gaudiamat. So Prabhupada knew that it was there in the Gaudiamat and he brought it into the ISKCON society. He said our devotees also, we should also have this kind of course, education, study of the books, very important. Prabhupada writes that it's good to read the books, but it's more important when you explain the books and discuss them together. You need to discuss together and you need to explain them, not just simply read. Often you can read and then put the book down and you ask them, what did you read? Oh, hmm, I, I don't remember. <laughs> right? People are like that sometimes. We read but we don't read very carefully. And whatever's there, it just doesn't go in. We don't really absorb it. 
So it's, it's important for us with Prabhupada's books that we don't just simply read them, or sometimes you hear, we say, goes in one ear and goes out the other. Mm -hmm. So that's not what you want. You want it to come in and go to the heart. The message should go to the heart. We have to clean the heart, for it's very important to hear very carefully. And we have to hear for a long time. Because remember, we are Nitya Bada. We are eternally conditioned souls. Meaning, we've been in this material world a very long time. So our conditioning is very deep. Deep in, in the sense that we are very attached to the material body and the things in relation to this body. We think of Aham and Mami Ki. I am this body. And this means I have these senses. And we think that life is just meant for satisfying the senses. But the, that is not Krishna consciousness. So Srila Prabhupada wanted all of us to read his books, to study his books carefully. So I remember uh, Prabhupada came to London and he gave us all initiation. Initiation is important. Sometimes people think, oh, I'm reading, I'm chanting, I don't need to get initiated. Why get initiated? Oh, it's, it's important because initiation is the commitment to the practice of Krishna consciousness. And we have to be committed to chanting and to serving Krishna and following the principles of Krishna consciousness. Sometimes people are just thinking, oh, it's okay, you know, I don't need to be initiated, I already chanting, I'm doing everything. But if you're not initiated, you don't have the official connection. No. And that's very important. We need the spiritual teacher, Srila Prabhupada there, as the founder of the Krishna consciousness movement. We need to have a connection to him and to the great Acharyas because they will bring us to Krishna. So that connection is very important. So I was fortunate, although I was very young, I knew, but Prabhupada accepted me and said, we all got, and most of it, practically everybody in the temple got initiated at that time. And that time, so far, also got his initiation. Gave, that's why he gave him the name Subha, looked very auspicious. He came to London to get Krishna consciousness. But an interesting thing happened when he got the initiation that uh, the, the next day Prabhupada called the temple president to his room and he said, You know, he said, Yesterday I gave your man initiation. Many of them, they said, I gave them all initiation. They said, None of them gave me any guru dakshin. And <laughs> 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 the temple president laughed, so, so just like you were laughing, he said, Prophet, they don't have any money. <laughs> <laughs> so that was the situation in 1971. You know, we joined the Krishna consciousness movement. And when we joined, we just gave whatever, we give everything. Because we were just maintaining the temple. The temple was, the, the devotees were just simply those living in the ashram. And there was no congregation. We had not cultivated the congregation yet. We were a new society. And so it takes time to gather support and to get people to contribute. It takes time to develop faith. 
in the Krishna consciousness movement. I remember I came to Hyderabad in 1978. I was asked, actually they asked me to be the temple president of the temple there in Hyderabad in 1978. The temple had been opened in 1976 and there was still no door on the temple. <laughs> There was no door. I used to sleep every night in the doorway because there was no door. It was a very basic temple when we opened it. I just went there a month ago, or when, last time I was here in Hyderabad, a couple of months ago, I went there to Abbots and I saw the temple and I couldn't recognize it. It's changed so much from the days when I was there in 1978, the temple was opened, but it was very basic. basic. The land had been donated by Pularedi, the sweet man, and uh, we raised the funds by doing life membership programs. The devotees would travel around in and request people to become a life member. And in this way, we'd get funds to build the temple and to make the temple. But it was very different. And similarly, in London, we had the temple. They were rented the house. We were struggling to pay the rent. We did not have any real income. Our income was simply by distributing Back to Godhead magazine on the streets every day in London and we would chant Hare Krishna. We would do Sankirtan on the street every day. And we would take books. The only books we had were Back to Godhead magazines and we had that Krishna book, volume one, which had been donated. The money for that had been donated by the English musician. So that was the only books we had. And if you could sell a Krishna book, wow, oh, oh, we would be in ecstasy. You'd think, wonderful, we could sell one book. And it, it was very, it was very challenging times. We were working for the service of Krishna. Prabhupada in the beginning, you know, when I joined the Krishna Conscious Movement, they told me, it's okay, you just give the book, people don't have to give donations. So I thought, oh, that's good. <laughs> I, 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 I didn't like asking people for money, you know, you don't want to be out there asking for each other stuff. No, no, if people want to give, you can take the donation, but if they don't give, it's okay, just give them the book. So, okay, I thought, <laughs> so we would do like that. But then a short while after I'd been a devotee, Prabhupada wrote another letter and said, everyone should pay. <laughs> he said, any gentleman, he will give at least a quarter, meaning 25 cents U.S. dollar. He said, every gentleman will give at least a quarter for our magazine. That is the cost of our bank to go to the magazine. So Prabhupada said, the temples are taking the books, they have to pay for them. They have to pay the DVT. Because the DVT needs the money to print more books. And if you take the books and don't pay for them, they won't be able to print any more books. So every temple takes books, they have to pay for the books. And so if you're going to pay for the books, you have to raise the money from the books, you have to sell the books. So that was the magazine. Then Prabhupada said, actual book distribution means big book. <laughs> Not just selling little magazines, he said you should sell big books. He wanted the big books. So in this way we were being challenged. Prabhupada was pushing us, pushing us, pushing us. He said, my Guru Maharaj pushed me, I am pushing you. <laughs> and he did, he pushed us. We would distribute the books and we would feel so pleased. We'd show Prabhupada the result. Prabhupada would say, very good, now double it. <laughs> <coughs> you know, the, the, the Prabhupada was just unbelievable. 
how to please him, how to satisfy him. No question, there's so much you can do for the service of Krishna. And so we, we were we were having more and more people join the Krishna consciousness movement. Somehow, in those days when I became a devotee, there were more and more young people joining the Krishna consciousness movement. And they were joining full time. They were coming to be full time devotees, to dedicate their life. So, uh, the temple was becoming full, difficult to accommodate everyone. And we were looking for a new building. We were thinking where to get a building. And they found this one building, it was a church. And so the devotee thought this would make a nice temple, we could have a temple here. And wrote to Prabhupada and told Prabhupada about it, that Prabhupada is this church, we think we get this one would make a nice temple. Prabhupada wrote back, he told us about chasing rhinoceros. He said, yes, hunt for, when you go hunting, chase the, the rhino. Don't go for rabbits. If you miss the rabbit, everyone will act one. Ah, you missed. But if you miss the rhino, they say, you're very difficult. Rhinos are big, powerful things. You know, you took a big risk. But Prabhupada encouraged us like that to always go for the big thing. Think big. Uh, when the devotees first came to India, they were looking for land in Vrindavan. So Prabhupada wanted to get something in Vrindavan and the devotees went and one devotee said to Prabhupada, said, Prabhupada, why don't we get a place just like something like Radha Damodar? Have you been to Vrindavan? You won't be, you won't be there, right? You've seen Radha Damodar? So just a little temple, you know. And he said, why don't we get a place just like that? Just like Radha Damodar, a small place. But Prabhupada said to the devotee, said, I cannot think small. I have to think big. <laughs> he didn't want to do anything. Small. We wanted something. It should be big. Proper wanting. Going to do. And proper was saying, "What is the good of you being American unless you do something wonderful for Krishna?" <laughs> this way, proper pushed the devotees more and more. Get them to to sacrifice everything for Krishna. And it got results, it got wonderful results, you can see. People came forward, George Harrison donated the Bhaktivedanta Manor, beautiful place in the countryside, just in the outskirts of London. And then Amberish Ford came, and Amberish Ford, he donated his house in Hawaii, and then they helped to purchase the place. the war. In 18 days, Krishna gave them the whole world. So it's Prabhupada said, be part of Krishna's 18-day plan. He can give you the whole world. Are you ready? <laughs> Prabhupada wants, wants us to think how the, the, the sky is the limit. There's no limit in Krishna. So I was with Prabhupada in Calcutta. I come to India. I went to America, and I was in the USA for some time. And then uh, 
His Holiness Gopal Krishna Goswami, at that time he was living in New York, and Prabhupada wanted him to come to India to take up some management for the society in India. Because Prabhupada needed some Indian bodied people to take on the management, to do the management. So Gopal Krishna Maharaj, he was Prabhu at that time, and knew he was in New York, and Prabhupada told him to come back to India. So when he was told to come back to India, he arranged with the temple president in New York. He said, I want, you should give me some men to bring to India. Because at that time, there were very few devotees in India. We did not have temples. There was no temples anywhere, initially, of course. Uh, the only devotees were the few Westerners who had come. You know, they used to call the Vrindavan temple Angrezi Mandir. <laughs> you know that? Yeah? The Angrezi Mandir. Nowadays, of course, they don't call it that. It used to be like that. Because in those days, in the beginning, we were all Westerners. And we had come to begin the Krishna consciousness movement. So, uh, People were, Indian people gradually they came, gradually they joined. But uh, Gopal Krishna Prabhu was coming back to India to t and so he wanted some men. And so I was there in New York and he, wanted, he asked me to come because he said, you're British. And he said, for British people, it's easier to stay in India at that time. Not today. <laughs> But at, at that time it was. At that time we didn't even need a visa. And, and Americans were having a very difficult time to get a visa for India. And there was even some consideration that all oh, Americans, these Hare Krishna people, they're CIA agents. And they're coming to overthrow the Indian government. And something like that. You know, these kind of things were going on. And so it was difficult for American people to get visas to come to India. So Gopal Krishna brought me to India and I came with him in 1975. We came here to India. At that time, there was a very small center in Delhi, in Bengali market. We had a little rented house in Delhi and there was the Vrindavan temple had been opened, that was opened. So, so people didn't like to stay in Delhi. Now we have wonderful temples, big temples here in Delhi. Changed a lot. And Mumbai, there was nothing in Mumbai. The devotees were living in Juhu, but there was no building, there was no temple, they were just living in tents. So it was very, very early days of the Krishna consciousness movement. But Prabhupada kept everything going and he was always coming and always in touch with the leaders and he would always come around and visit and see all the different centers and see the programs and see what's going on. So I remember one time we were in Calcutta, and Prabhupada always liked to see the prasada. You know, wherever he was, wherever in the world, he, he would say, where's the prasada? I want to see what you're serving to the guests. Let me see the prasada. So, he would always want to taste the prasada. That happened one day in Calcutta, the fruit offering came off the altar. So Prabhupada said, bring me some fruit, let me see what you offer to the deity. And then Prabhupada saw the fruit and he tasted it. And then he said, who has purchased this fruit? And so they said, oh, Devu, Devu purchased it. Devu, he's a, he's a Bengali man, young man, who used to come to the temple. He used to do service. And so he's Bengali, so they would get him to buy the fruit, you know, being a local man. 
So anyway, Paul Pat said, oh, Debu brought the fruit. He said, tell Debu to come here. <laughs> so Debu went in to see Prabhupada and Prabhupada told him, he said, you're Bengali, you don't know how to buy fruit. <laughs> Bengali, you should know how to buy fruit. This fruit you bought for the needs is terrible. So Prabhupada is so careful, so particular like that. You know, he cared a lot about everything. If the prasadam was not good, he would say, this, this is terrible. Who cooked this? He was very particular. And then accounts also. The budget, the money for the temple. Especially like here in India, as well as in the UK, we're registered. We're registered and we have tax exemption. And so if you want to get tax exemption, you have to have accounts. You have to show your accounts every year. So Prabhupada came, he said, where are the accounts? I want to see the accounts. Who's keeping the accounts? Prabhupada would look at the accounts and see everything that are being done properly. He was very concerned. They do everything nicely. And then it should be done also legally. In this way, the Krishna consciousness movement can become more established and bona fide, recognized and respected. And so Prabhupada put so much energy, not only into writing his books, but into managing the society in overseeing the affairs of our society. Especially in places like Mayapur and Vrindavan, which were very, very important places, holy places. So whenever Prabhupada would come to Mayapur, he would go around the grounds and see you see what's going on around the place. And it was in Mayapur that it happened one day that Prabhupada saw all the children that they were fighting over the garbage that what had been thrown out. The children, the neighborhood children, the local children were fighting over the garbage and the dogs were there and they were fighting with the dogs. The dogs were trying to eat and the children were trying to eat. And Prabhupada saw the situation, Prabhupada was very concerned. And at that time, Prabhupada gave the order, no one should go hungry within five miles of the temple. And then they began the Food for Life program, distributing prasada. Nowadays, of course, it's different. Now in my poor people, there's not that poverty which was there in 19... 70s. It's much better now. People have more money now. People come for prasadam in big numbers and they pay. They all pay something. They, they take prasadam. They're happy to come and take prasadam. So times change a bit. But Prabhupada was concerned. It shows Prabhupada's compassionate nature and his concern for everyone. That they should be properly provided for. The Prabhupada would also go around the grounds and look and see everything is it clean, is it all being maintained nicely. One day he was walking around and he opened the door of a toilet and he saw inside the toilet it was not clean. And Prabhupada was very upset and he said, he gave the example because Prabhupada had studied chemistry, so he gave a chemical equation. Base plus acid gives salt plus water. Right? You know that? Anybody who studied chemistry a little bit, you know that very basic equation. When you bring a base in contact with an acid, there will be a reaction. And Prabhupada used this to give an example. A brahmana, when he contacts a dirty place, he has to clean it. He cannot leave it dirty. He must clean the place. Very important. If you don't clean the place, you lose your status. You fall from the Brahminical path. <coughs> so very important to understand these things.
the Prophet was training us like this, keep everything clean. One time in London, we were worshipping on the altar. So on the, the London temple was a rain. <coughs> on, the, on the lower level was Radha Landanishwara, and we had Jagannath Baladev Supadra above them, on the top. And there was a, like a shelf there with Jagannath Baladev Supadra. And Radha Landanishwara were below. So Prabhupada came for the deity greeting, and somehow, we had only put flowers around Radha Mandanishwara and there were no vases on top around Jagana. Prabhupada immediately noticed. Why? Why so much here? Nothing there. He pointed out, did you must put flowers there also? Did why I am the only one to notice these things? Why other people don't notice these things? Another time we got the pictures of the disciplic succession. You know, we were rushing to get the altar ready for Prabhupada coming to open the curtains on time. And somehow we put the pictures of the simple succession in the wrong order. You know, sometimes you, people don't know who's, who's who and what's proper order. And they think Gorky Shorda's Babaji mixed up with Jagannatha's Babaji. And, and sometimes even Mark did not, they, they just get it all wrong. So then we have the pictures wrong. And Prabhupada is very upset. And Prabhupada is upset. Look at this. Who's done this? He just ties us. So that is the mercy of the spiritual master. When you get chastised by the spiritual master, that's his special mercy. And we should appreciate these moments. That he cares so much for us. He's guiding us, training us. And Prabhupada told himself how he got corrected by him, his own spiritual master. Prabhupada told he was sitting listening to Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasati one time. Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasati was giving a lecture and Prabhupada was sitting there in the audience. And he was sitting there and it happened somebody behind him touched him on the shoulder. An elderly man who was sitting behind him touched him on the shoulder. So Prabhupada turned around, looked around, and immediately Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasati, you too! <laughs> Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasati noticed that and he pointed out to the, the two. He said, he said to the man who had touched Prabhupada's shoulder, he said to him, he said, do you think you have purchased me because you donate 10 rupees every month? And then he said to Prabhupada, to our own founder Acharya, he said, Do you want to come up here and talk? And Prabhupada said, I was mortified. He said, I could have died on the spot. He said, It was a moment of greatest mercy to get the chastisement from the spiritual master. So uh, Prabhupada, uh, he also chastised us as he got chastised by his guru. He also would chastise us regularly, what he wanted, how we have to do things, how we have to be careful to keep the standards and not to compromise. He wanted very much that the Krishna consciousness movement would come of age, it would mature nicely. And he knew that in the future there will be many temples. And there will be many devotees. But he also was concerned that we should keep the standards. Don't compromise. You know, sometimes people say, Oh, six, 16 rounds is too many. If we just have to check four rounds, it would be good. But 16 rounds, oh, it's too many. And then after, if you make it four rounds, then you'll say four rounds is too many. <laughs> and then say it should be one round. And then you'll say one round, one round, just check. When you feel like it. Like that, everything will become useless. And sometimes people say, four principles is too strict, too much. Four principles. If it was just three principles, we could have many people. 
know, some people say like that. The white board principle should just be three. No? No. If it's only three, it means no pure devotees. If it's four principles, then it's a movement of pure devotees. But if it's only three principles, then no pure devotees. Everybody's engaging in sinful activity. So that's the difference. We want a movement of pure devotees. And then great things can happen. The Krishna consciousness movement can change the face of the world by preaching Krishna consciousness. Just simply by chanting, book distribution, the world is changing. We may say, well, we haven't gone, we haven't gone very far. We've got wars between Russia and Ukraine. You've got so many things going on between China and Taiwan and here and there. There's, so, there's Afghanistan and this and that. What does Krishna consciousness do? Actually, Krishna consciousness has helped a lot for those people who are willing to hear. There are two classes of people. We have the, de the devotees and the demons. Those who are not devotees, they are the asuras, the demons. Though they have their demonic qualities, that's there. But the devotees are becoming more and more. There are more and more devotees growing everywhere. We see more and more people taking interest in Krishna. And we hope it will go on. It will go on if we are painful, if we are strict and keep up the standards which Srila Prabhupada has given us. Alright, so I will ask, is there any questions? Anybody want to ask? Anyone want to say any comment or question? Yes, Prabhu? Thank you so much for wonderful class, Madhas, wonderful pastime of Prabhupada and relation. So I just wanted to ask one thing, Maharaj. Uh, whenever I see that you carry so much enthusiasm and energy to serve the, all the Vaishnavas and Prabhupada movement, which I just, uh, this year in Naudhi Mandal Parikrama, I saw you, Maharaj, the movement, the, the enthusiasm level which you carry and inspire you. So I just want to know the secret and inspiration. How do you carry, Maharaj, that? The secret behind the your... The secret. I mean, well, how, where do we become enthusiastic? We get enthusiasm by association with other enthusiastic devotees. We see other wonderful devotees doing so much for Krishna. Wonderful devotees like Gopal Krishna Goswami and Jagpataka Swami, Bhaktivinoda Swami, they're doing so much. They're traveling so much. They're so active preaching. And so we get a little enthusiasm from seeing the nice examples of other people. Enthusiasm is contagious. You get it from others. You associate, you always want to associate with enthusiastic people. Enthusiasm is described in the nectar of instruction. Srila Prabhupada describes what is enthusiasm. Endeavoring with intelligence in the service of Krishna. That is how Prabhupada describes enthusiasm. Not just being wild, oh, I have to go away. You know, not enthusiasm, intelligence, endeavoring with intelligence for the service of Krishna. So we have to remember that also. We use our intelligence in the proper manner for the service of Krishna and take inspiration from nice devotees who are successful and trying very hard to please Prabhupada. We want to keep that motivation there that we want to please Prabhupada. We want to try to satisfy Prabhupada. You should always think, will Prabhupada be pleased with my effort? Mm-hmm.
Did any other question? Anyone? So do you all go to Mayapur? You all been to Mayapur? Yes. Yes? Do you come to the Navadri Nav 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 Paragraph? Yes. Yes? No? No? Yes. Hmm? The Navadri Paragraph. Very nice. Of course, soon they will have the Raja, the Raja Manga Paragraph. The Kartik Man. From the Gopi Fight to go to Raja. The Raja Paragraph. For a month, if you have the time, there's a lot of purification there. But your home is also a holy place. Make your home like Vrindavan or like Mayapur. You don't, you don't become Krishna conscious just by going to the place. You have to develop the consciousness wherever you are. Just like Prabhupada went to America, but Prabhupada said, I'm always in Vrindavan. I'm always thinking of Krishna. So it's not just buying a ticket which takes us into the Holy Dawn, but it's changing the consciousness. And we have to develop the consciousness of devotees by regularly hearing and chanting through the association of devotees. So I was hearing many wonderful devotees are coming and visiting you here. You get a lot of association. You're somehow, you're blessed. So many different sannyasis are coming here and visiting here. Other places, they don't get that. Somehow, I don't know, you're so fortunate and you should appreciate that special attention that so many senior spiritual teachers, spiritual leaders are coming here and spending time here to guide you and to give you association. So take advantage, continue yourself, take advantage of their association to hear and hear carefully. Srila Prabhupada came for initiation from his spiritual master and Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasati said to him, Oh yes, I have noted him. He likes to hear. He does not go away. You know, sometimes people come, whenever you begin the lecture, they go away. <laughs> or they go to sleep. You know, we, we talk about it, we say, when we say Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya, it's the go to sleep mantra. <laughs> and when we say Sharera Abhijajau, that's the very cup mantra. <laughs> so, that's not very ideal, but unfortunately it's like that. Yeah. Mm. We do want to hear carefully. We need to hear, and we need to develop that taste for hearing. And in the beginning, it's not so easy. And Srila Prabhupada also told us, he said, when he used to hear his own spiritual teacher in the beginning, he could not understand. But he did not go away. So that's important. So even though we don't understand, you know, don't go away. Just like these young men, they're very young men, but they're hearing, they're not going away. It's very good. They must be very nice devotees. So very pleased to see that the young people are also taking an interest in Krishna consciousness. But the children are the future of our Krishna consciousness movement. So we we do need to care and give them more and more facility and encouragement to take up Krishna consciousness.
All of us, like we had wonderful time this evening hearing about Srila Prabhupada and his pastimes. Thank you very much, Maharaj. We pray that you please come here more often and uh, like I inspire us like this. Hare Krishna. Like now, let's thank Maharaj one more time by loudly chanting Hare Krishna Mahamatra three times. Hare, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare. Tomorrow. Maharaj will be there in the Mangalarti. Hare Krishna. Please all, yeah. all of you come. Let's go. Nice. 